let us take a journey back into time, back thousands of millions of years to when the Earth was young. And this is how it might have looked, for it was once only a fiery ball of rock, without continents, oceans, or air, or living things of any kind. But then the surface began to cool and shrink, and from the interior, which has remained flaming hot even to this day, hot steam and gases were squeezed out to form the Earth's primeval atmosphere. An atmosphere so thick, the sun's rays couldn't break through, and only lightning flashes pierced the darkness. The clouds were overladen with moisture, but if any rain fell, the crust would only boil it back again as steam. But at last, the crust cooled below the boiling point, and the rains began in earnest. How long it rained, no one knows, but it filled up all the vast hollows of the earth and formed its first seas. For a long time afterward, the crust continued to buckle and crack and grow thicker, while the gases trapped underneath forced their way out through volcanoes. And these gases, which were rich in chemicals of all kinds, emptied into the atmosphere and boiled up in the seas. There was as yet no living thing anywhere in the world. Carbon compounds, which are the building blocks of life, were slowly linking up in the seas. And one day, scientists think it was over 2,000 million years ago, the first living things appeared. What they were like, no one really knows, for they left no trace behind. But they must have been far simpler and smaller than these microscopic organisms which are believed to be their closest living relatives. Instead, we imagine them to have been mere particles of protoplasm, not yet organized into cells, but already able to grow and to move and to copy themselves, that is, to act alive. Nor do we know a great deal more about those which came after for their soft, tiny bodies were buried in the mud and sand and crushed into rock. Rocks that were later raised up by some action of the crust. All that we can be sure of is that as time went by, certain species grew larger and larger and more and more complex. And that at last, some animals appeared with bodies that were hard enough and large enough to leave their distinctive marks in the ancient mud. And it is through these remains or fossils that our history of life is traced. Which takes us back over 500 million years to the dawn of the Paleozoic Age, when everything that lived, lived in the water. And the leading animals of the world were the trilobites and worms. The trilobites were actually very primitive arthropods, members of that large group of animals whose skeletons grow outside their bodies. But they were then the highest animals in the world. While the worms, who were soft-bodied, had already had a long line of development. Advancing another 150 million years, we find that in the shallow waters there are now great sea scorpions, ranging up to nine feet in length and also very simple fishes with just a trace of a backbone. The oceans, meanwhile, were becoming crowded with shellfish. And on the sea floor grew flower-like crinoids and corals and sponges. And there were still many trilobites, but they were no match for these giant nautiloids, the 15-foot monsters who had now become the rulers of the deep. 
And again we move forward in time, only to find that life is still confined to the water, and that plants have not yet progressed beyond a primitive kind of fern. But the animal kingdom has taken another giant step forward by producing fishes with inner skeletons, the first true vertebrates. And here, in their tremendously bulky armor, are some of these early vertebrate fishes as they graze along the dark sea floor. And these are the scaly lobe-finned fishes who could breathe not only in water but out of it, and whose fins had sturdy bones in them. As we are about to see, this was to mark them for a most important role in the development of the higher animals. For in time, the shallow waters drained away, and in their wake, there arose forests of huge tree ferns, equisetums, and mosses. The plants had conquered the land, and were now producing the food and oxygen that land animals need to live. And the amphibians, the great-great-grandchildren of the lobe fin fishes had crept out after them. Having now grown lungs and the clumsiest of feet, they had become the first backboned animals to leave the sea. But they couldn't leave it altogether, for they still had to return to the water to lay their eggs and to be born in as the fishes before them. Insects, too, appeared about this time, and some grew to be giants like this two-and-a-half-foot dragonfly preserved for us as a fossil. Ferns, equisetums, and mosses are still plentiful in the world today, but not the giants of the Paleozoic age. They toppled into the swamps, and with the ages, turned into peat and coal, which are their remains. Same is true of the amphibians. The 10 and 15 foot monsters all died out, leaving behind only a few pygmy families, like the salamanders and frogs, and these strange and fish-like axolotls. But the amphibians had meanwhile given birth to a new kind of animal, the reptile. The world had grown colder and drier, for the land had again risen, and these thick-skinned reptiles, whose eggs could hatch on dry land, were branching out, producing clumsy, bow-legged varieties who lived off plants. And others who were savage and agile flesh-eaters. The lush forest had given way to smaller, tougher plants, and the reign of the amphibian was over. And now the curtain was rising on a new age of life, Mesozoic, throughout whose entire span of 130 million years, the reptiles were to sweep the earth. Some grew into huge swamp lizards, like the dinosaur Diplodocus, who was the longest animal ever to walk the earth. Though for all his wonderful frame, he was almost brainless. Others sprouted featherless wings and took to the air. Such was the lizard Pteranodon, whose wing spread of 27 feet was the largest in history. Many of the reptiles returned to the sea, among them the lizard Mosasaur, who is believed to have been the most ferocious sea creature that ever lived. And as always, the waters teemed with shellfish. But it was the Belemnites who were now the most numerous. And here we see them attacked by a large fish-like reptile called the Ichthyosaur who was himself the prey of the really enormous Pliosaurus. But chiefly, it was the age of the dinosaurs, of the great land lizards who specialized in armor, and those who depended on speed and ferocity. Their varieties seemed endless. And yet, when the land began once more to rise, ending the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs and nearly all the other large reptiles vanished from the earth and no one quite knows why. It was almost as if the world was being cleared of the reptiles to make way for the warm-blooded birds and mammals who were their descendants. Today, only a few orders of reptiles remain. The lizards, the 
snakes, the crocodiles, and the heavily armored turtles and tortoises. And this is the fossil of an Archaeopteryx, the first known bird, though he still had the teeth of a reptile. Our own age, the Cenozoic, began about 70 million years ago. And by the time this herd of primitive mammals appeared, about the middle of the Cenozoic, the birds had conquered the air, and the mammals, with their improved brains and nervous systems, their warm, even body temperatures, and their better way of bringing up their young, had become the dominant animals of the world. The highest of the mammals is man, whose earliest traces we find at the beginning of the Ice Age, less than a million years ago, when the Earth had already put on its familiar appearance. We call this first known man, Pithecanthropus, which means ape man. But already he was far more man than ape, for he knew how to use fire and to talk and to make simple tools out of stone and bone. Long afterward, there arose the Neanderthal man, who was more intelligent and had a higher way of life. But a higher man still was developing, whom on account of his superior brain we call Homo sapiens, the knowing or wise man. And with his coming, all the earlier species of men disappeared. In this cave, we see a 40,000-year-old skeleton of a man whose body and brain were already similar to our own, together with his weapons of stone and flint. And these are his works of art, the animals he hunted and drew upon the walls of his caves. Some of these mammals, now vanished, may have been hunted down by man himself. For with his great gifts of cunning and his marvelously skillful hands, he soon became the most successful of hunters. As his knowledge and his skills increased, as he learned to read and to write and to pass on his thoughts to others, he spread his rule over the entire face of the earth. And his power has been growing ever since to build and to destroy. For man has found a new way to develop, and not by changing his body as other animals do, but by learning new things, and by inventing machines that do the changing for him. And so, without growing fins or wings, but only by the power of his mind, he has learned to outswim the fishes and outfly the birds. He has split the invisible atom and reached out to the distant stars. And all this in the last 50 years of man's million year span of life's 2,000 million years on the earth.